Okay, I think let's just start where we just left off and just tell me what your what you felt the depression was. Mm -hmm. You know, the condition of the country at, at, at right. that time in '34. Right. 1934 was something of a pivotal year in the history of the Depression. It was, we'd been through, particularly if we were in the Middle West and the Northwest where I was, we'd been through at least three or four years of depression. I mean, our crops had been without value, uh, work was very scarce, and it was, we were in a depressed area long before the consequences of Wall Street's collapse hit us out there. In fact, we didn't know about Wall Street, you know. They know who owned stock in Aberdeen, South Dakota. Very, very few people. And uh, the state was not in an agitated... Okay, so let's go again just about what you felt that the, you know, that you felt that the Depression was inevitable. Right, right. The Depression was uh, not a thing of great um, urgency. It didn't hit you all of a sudden in its totality. It crept up on you. It crept from the Middle West, where prices were down, farmlands were down and everything. And we didn't we didn't question it as as a, a historic procedure. It was sort of God's will. He imposed this on us, and we lived with it uh, reasonably comfortable. You had to move around. You had to job hunt, and if you were a young guy, you were particularly up the creek. But uh, I have no remembrance of being deeply engrossed in the significance of the impression until some alternatives turned up. By 1934, the government began to assert its role in our lives. It was the first time that the government had come into a, a working relationship with people in great numbers. I remember the first piece of legislation was a federal works program. And, uh, Actually, I'm not, I don't want to... I'll stop you here because I don't really want to get into that right. part of it. Okay. But it, just to repeat just again the inevitable, that you just felt that there was nothing you could do about the depression? Right. Right. You want to repeat on that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the depression did not hit us all of a sudden with great dramatic force. We kind of slid into it. And we, we had no sense that it was a great financial collapse. We just thought that things were tough and uh, that it had been imposed on us historically. We knew there had been... But things were always tough, right? So it didn't yeah. seem like any different? Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, they got tougher. It was a, it was a creeping sort of thing. It, it, uh, until it hit you, it was somebody else, someplace else, the other fellow. Uh, but gradually, with the, even the simplest kind of hard hand labor, ditch digging, uh, harvest work, and what have you, those kind of jobs began to vanish, and you had people congregating working men. We had a great class of working men in those days, uh, the likes of which doesn't exist now. Either you're in the middle class or you're on welfare, you know, and, and that division in anxiety. These hard hand laborers were in the, in the American economy in thousands. I remember towns like Duluth and Spokane and later Los Angeles and San Francisco where thousands of men were on the street. And uh, everybody got up in the morning and went someplace where they'd had a tip there was going to be a job. And when you got there with your tip and all, here were three or four hundred men outside the gate fighting like dogs to get through to where there were maybe three or four jobs wanted on the, on the gang in the hole, you know? And it was, uh, it was uh, massive, uh, but ill-defined. We didn't know, the guys would go down early in the morning and they'd line up or whatever you thought there's gonna be a job and by nine o'clock you knew there wasn't going to be, so you drifted over to the skid row and there's where you hit your agitators. That's in the old days of agitators. These guys would be up on a box or a chair 
and some of them were preaching communism, some of them were preaching religion and socialism. I remember one black preacher says, sitting standing up, and he had a pair of gloves on, just white cotton gloves, and he'd wring his hands and he'd say, Jesus Christ say he's coming in a crowd. He ain't gonna come through a crowd, he ain't coming by a crowd, he's coming in a crowd. You know, just senseless maunderings, but men would gather around and they'd shout derisively to him. It didn't bother him, he just kept going. But then, about after an hour or so of that, they'd form up and they'd march on City Hall. Yeah, okay, let's move on to... Okay, something um, else, something good else. enough. <laughs> um, I want you to tell me about, um, actually in this vein, when you first heard um, Upton Sinclair, tell me about going into the meeting and what attracted right. him. Right, right. My my first experience of encountering Upton Sinclair was a result of wandering around downtown in Los Angeles looking for something to do and so hopefully some kind of work to earn a few bucks, a few quarters. And uh, I came to this hall. I can't remember where it was, but it was somewhere not too far from the Biltmore. And, uh, I went in. I'd, I'd read about Sinclair in the, in the papers, but I'd never seen him. And I went in, sat down, and we sat there. There was probably three or four hundred men, most of whom were just tickled to death to get a place to sit down. Now they didn't come there for enlightenment. But out on the stage came this little dapper fellow, a little silver-haired guy, small, uh, looking like a, a professional man that had no relationship with that audience and wore glasses, a kind of princeness sort of thing which set him apart from the run of the mine anyhow. And he began his speech. Well, I had uh, been reading some of his stuff, and I, I had read the book Jungle, The Jungle, and I was terribly imp impressed with that book. He, he makes a clever <laughs> remark about that book. He says that he wrote that book to get to the minds and hearts of the American people and he hit them in the stomach because it, it, it didn't result in any great sympathy for the workers, which he was out to create, but it, the Americans as a people became aware of the filthy conditions under which their meat was being prepared and it caused a whole revision in all the laws applied to it. Well, he, he, was, he reached you with the common sense that you felt in his thesis that we should have had millions of people out of work and we should be producing for consumption. And poverty in California was predicated basically on the theory that uh, you've got all this manpower and all this talent and all these goods going to waste. And uh, it, what would make sense would be to apply the, the use of those goods and the production of goods to meet the needs of those who had nothing. And if you were one of us, as most of us were sitting in that audience, that made a hell of a lot of sense. Why did it make sense? Because we had, we, we would stand around on the streets of the city. Take Los Angeles, for example. I can remember when there was a man on every corner, huckstering fruit, or uh, particularly oranges. Big sack of oranges for 25 cents, you know, 12, 15 pounds. And everywhere you read about the destruction of crops. I remember the story, of, well, I think there was a photo of it in one of the LA papers, of almost a quarter mile long pile of oranges as high as your head. And they'd throw gasoline up over it and set fire to it and burn them up just, just to get them off the market. The market prices had collapsed. And that was true everywhere in, in South Dakota. I remember harvesting wheat and when we sold it for 27 cents a bushel, and you couldn't hardly pay for the gas that you use hauling it to the elevator. That was that total collapse of that uh, economy. So then, then the drama of it began to come home. But it wasn't the working stiffs that caused the trouble. The, the, where they tried to attempt to lynch one of the government agents was in Iowa, a group of farmers attacked this truck and spilled the milk and you saw it all over the country and that was the first incidence of violence. Let's go back to Upton Sinclair though. Okay, yeah. Um, in Hang California. on him. And when you described it to me before, it's more of an emotional response. I mean, you knew that they were...
Well, it's more of an emotional response. I mean, you knew that they were pouring, I mean, the idea that they were pouring gasoline right. on these oranges and there were people that are hungry. Right. Kind of tell me kind of what you felt as a 17-year-old right. at the right. time. I was a 17-year-old kid when this was going on, and I wasn't uh, a choice police in the marketplace. But I was hungry. I stole milk off the back porches to eat. We had bottle milk in those days, so you could steal a bottle of milk and drink it and sell the bottle for a dime. And so it was a common, ordinary way of staying alive was to pilfer those back porches in the early morning. Well, into this thing stepped this little silver-haired man, right? Saying things that, even to my young mind, made sense in terms of, of uh, need and in terms of the circumstances that existed. He reached, it's funny, you know, he was not a dramatic speaker. He was a very pedantic sort of a dude. He felt deeply, but he was not a glamorous soul that moved you with passion and that sort of thing. He just laid it out very fundamentally in a very ordinary type of delivery. He wrote much more ferociously than he spoke. And when he wrote, his language was full of fire and, and uh, you didn't forget it. But, but somehow or other, he reached you. You know, he had, he had a, there was this earnestness about him. And uh, uh, he felt, you felt like somebody was speaking to your circumstance. And not very few people were in those days. It wasn't, it wasn't as though there was a plenitude of this kind of thought. He was, he had, a, he had a, a way of speaking and of taking you with logic to his ultimate conclusion. Now you said you were very inspired by it. Oh, this, okay. That's great. Thing. Change. Okay, you were telling me before about how Sinclair captured your imagination right. and how he inspired you. Right. Tell me about that feeling in you that he evoked. All right, good. I suppose that Upton Sinclair was one of the real basic formative factors in the way I've lived my life. He, uh, he had a sense of, of making you want to do something good and serve people. And it became the underlying thesis of my whole political and public career because uh, I, never, I never lost the basic fact that he put into that, you know. Uh, production for use. I still can live with that as a slogan very effectively and I think, as a matter of fact, I'm struck with it today because night before last on the tube, you don't want that story? No. Okay. We need to stay back in, in, All right. in, in the time period. Right. Um, but it, it, let's just continue on. Though. What's product, explain to me again what was production for use and what it meant to you as right. a 17-year-old. Right. Production for use was a concept that appealed to me because I had been without many things and many essentials for a long time. I'm talking about food and shelter. And at the same time, the, the country was full of rotting services and, and, and fruit and vegetables and everything. You couldn't sell them, you couldn't give them away, but they weren't made available to you. One, one more time on this, and, and the way that you told it to me before, which was that you had seen that you knew that they were pouring gasoline all over the orange. Right, right. And then you had, and then you were hungry. And right, right. Can you just start that one? If you can imagine uh, how it must have seemed to me as a kid without resources and hunger to pick up a newspaper and see a photograph of huge monumental piles of oranges, and I'm not talking about throwaways or culls. These are choice oranges, right? And they'd throw gasoline up over there, and here'd be a big bonfire, which didn't really consume the oranges, but destroyed them. I think as much as anything else, it was the destruction of them. It wasn't that they, if they'd burned them all up, that would have meant something, but instead here was a pile of unusable waste, you know? And, and that outraged me. That filled me with rage. And it, it, continues to fill me with rage when, when I encounter hunger and supplies sitting unrelated. 
And I've had a lot of occasions to do that in my life. And how did Sinclair connect those concepts to you? Well, uh, immediately it came to mind when he was speaking and he used the phrase production for use. This was an absolute refutation of what I'd seen. This was to make those oranges available to hungry people or whatever, whatever was involved, other stuff as well. And, uh, you know, if you're, if you're 17 and impressionable and you look at that and you think, God Almighty, what's, what's the matter? Where's the sense in this circumstance? And Sinclair was asking you to make sense out of it. That's, that's what grabbed people. And, and, you know, you have to understand that what's surprising is that instead of applause from the segment of the population who had things, they were scared to death of him. They saw him as the avenging angel come to balance out their sins. And, and uh, it was, it was an amazing thing to me how the animus of, the, of people was roused towards this little guy when, when he was trying to preach salvation, you know. He was, he was talking in terms of, of things that could greatly alter the circumstances of the worst off. He said, you used the words before that he captured your imagination. Mm -hmm. Can you use those words again as you're yeah. telling yeah. me what you felt about right. it? Right. I suppose the, the thing that stayed with me was almost visionary. This little man seemed like a sort of an avenging angel. He was, he was to find this kind of philosophy and this kind of concern flowing from a man as distinctive and as, as with the status he had in society. He was an established author of The Jungle and uh, Oil and these other books had come out. He was one of a group called uh, The Muckrakers. You remember Ida Tarbell and I can't remember, there was four or five of them who were labeled this and he was, he was the one that was the most productive and got it into the public mind and the public mainstream, some of these terrible circumstances. So how did he capture, you said that he, his words, his ideas captured your right. imagination? I suppose one of the most effective things about him was that without any hyper stuff or without anything, he spoke to you in a way that struck home with you and he became a source of inspiration and, and of, of philosophical enlightenment. He took you out of uh, out of the ordinary stuff that you'd had, but mind you, I'm a high school graduate at this time, so I'm a very learned man. But no place in that educational process had there been anything comparable that moved me or took hold of me and influenced my whole life the way his his discourses did. Good. Um, can um, uh, please stop for a second? Sure. Yeah. Let me get, let me get Got it. I had been out of high school for some time, and uh, I had traveled and worked in the Northwest principally. Up to that time, I worked in fruit, and I worked in the harvest, and I worked in the forest. I worked as a bull cook in a lumber camp. And uh, all of a sudden, I, my brothers were in California, two of them employed. And California was the land of milk and honey. Everybody thought if you can get to California and get a job, you make it, you know. So uh, my brothers had come home for Christmas, and we all had Christmas together, and they went back to California, and when they left, there was a great hole in my life. So I talked my dad into lending me a $5 bill, and I started hitchhiking south. And uh, California has always had a great appeal, and particularly the north-south pool along the, the coast, you know. Everything seemed ordinary in your home state of Washington, Oregon, but if you got over that border into California, you were tripping, you know. And uh, so I, you know, and then the, with the kind of illusions that a kid has, I could just see myself being discovered as a, as a movie talent. Somebody was bound to understand my beauty and, <laughs> and be intrigued by me. 
and particularly that was enforced up in our area when Bing Crosby came down here. Bing, Bing was a hometown boy. I was in high school and we hired him, his band, when he was going to Gonzaga to play the junior prom. So uh, he was an ordinary mortal who all of a sudden was, had just hit the happy land, right? And everybody thought that they were closer to Bing than they were, and you were going to come down and you are going to run into Bing and he was going to get you a job. <laughs> all those things, it, it was a, a pull that uh, no 17-year-old kid could resist. It was just much too much. You said also that you said there's like a magic about California. Yeah, yeah. Uh, California had a connotation of magic. It, uh, it was where things happened that no other state, no other community produced. You know, it was it was uh, it, it was excitement. Uh, it race it turned, ran all the way from horse races to movies. You know, those things and, and sports. USC was the dominant sports college on the West Coast in those days, and had glamour boys galore. And I remember going to. Uh, uh, one time I was in San Francisco and there was a big football game on there and I w wanted to go to it and I didn't know how to get in and just then the team came running by and Ernie Nevers from Stanford was playing and he handed me his helmet and said, there kid, bring that in for me, will you? And I said, I will go right into the ball game. So things could happen, anything could happen to you in California. It wasn't going to happen to you in Walla Walla or Spokane. But there was... Um, could, could oh, you want to slide? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, whatever. Okay. It's six. Mm -hmm. Um, so there was a magical pull, you know, a feeling. That's right. That's right. It was, uh, it was, uh, Wonderland. It, it had a outreach, and you wanted to be part of it because everything else at home seems so ordinary, but in California it was multiplied by X number. Even though times were hard and there weren't that many jobs in California, you still felt you could... That was not reported to us. That was not part of the makeup of the Spokane papers or the Walla Walla papers or what have you. That side of California wasn't portrayed. It was the glitz and glimmer side of it that you got in the press, you know? And uh, you, you didn't have any question, but if you could get to California, most of your problems would be solved. Uh, tell me how you got, did you ride the rails into California? Not that time. I did many times. I came down from, uh, I or, left. Or actually, tell me about riding the rails, about right. being guys like yourself looking right. for work. Right, right. It's hard to imagine in these days the, the degree to which transient America was on the railroads. There were hitchhikers. I did a lot of it myself. But the great mass of people swarmed onto those boxcars and into those gondolas. And if it was cold weather, you got in the reefer. You kicked open the top of a refrigerator and crawled down in that area. I went one time across from, I went out to Colton and I grabbed a train headed east. It was an orange train carrying all oranges, a manifest fruit train. And we went down through Phoenix and across to Tucson and up to Liberal, Kansas and on to Kansas City. But we stayed in that reefer, my kid brother and I, and we finally managed to rip loose some uh, restraining uh, wires there and get into the oranges. So we ate oranges all the way across the country and we never lost that train. By the time we got to Kansas City, my mouth was just a ring with sore. I was just, <laughs> the acid had really gotten to you. But... We have to change your phone. Okay, good. I should change it. Right, you know, um, riding the rails. Mm -hmm. People called you guys hobos, right? Yeah. And you would, and sometimes there was fear, you know, or there used to be, you know, the the concern of what did it That's mean right. for these hobos coming in? What do you think about that? The term hobo was seldom used by the guys that were on the road. It was a, it was a, something put together by the press and by the public, but you never thought of yourself as a hobo. You were a worker. You were looking for a job. Hobo had an implication of he's just riding the rails and going nowhere. He isn't looking for work. He wants a handout. <clears throat> well, that wasn't characteristic of the great volume of men who were on the road. 
they were looking for jobs, and they 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 moved around in relationship to the to the least memorable. Instead of saying they, because you were part of it, right? Right. Can you say we? Yeah, sure, okay. fine, right. Okay, That's good. Okay. The, uh, you ready? Yeah, I think so. The term hobo was something that was seldom heard by uh, or used by people that were on the road. We, we were looking for jobs. We were looking for the place where there's work, and at least kind of an indication that if you got to Wisconsin, there'd be a job. If you got to Minnesota, there was work. Or if you wanted to work in a harvest, get over into North Dakota. So that always there were, there, we really resented that term hobo. And it wasn't used among the fraternity of brotherhood of, of uh, free riders, or, or nor, the railroad men didn't call you hobos either. So what would be, were you, kind of ordinary guys just out of a job? Uh, there was every element of society reflected in there. I remember one time going into a jungle if we got off a train, and uh, there were oh, probably 150 guys there, right? And uh, there always was a mutual cook-up, you see. Everybody would go out and hit the stores get the waste vegetables, get the, bed, the unused cuts of meat, and then you all came together and you had these five-gallon oil cans, 10-gallon oil cans, and you cooked up a, a mulligan stew. And everybody shared in it, and uh, there was no price attached to it, but you were expected to go out and do your soliciting, for you know, if you took part in it. I remember one time a man in a very handsome suit wearing a tie and collar uh, it looked like he didn't belong there at all, and he, I got to talking to him, and he had just lost a good job, and he'd left his family, and he was heading out looking for work. That man stood out like a sore thumb because he was still dressed in the garb of Main Street, you know, but he was with us there, and, and uh, it was amazing the different talents that were shown in, in, in that community. And then there was the low life. I remember being in a jungle one night when a fella came down, a pimp, with two girls that were working for him, and he was selling those girls for 50 cents or a dollar apiece. Let me ask you, kind of to go back on, you know, another subject we had talked about before. I mean, a lot of times that you guys were being, or, or what the press was saying was that you were... Right. What about the government? You were radicals. Like yeah, that. right. What, I mean, in response to that, again, what what were you? Were you out to overthrow the government? There, there was a kind of a of a case made in the public press and uh, certain elements of the community who th tried to paint us as as villains, as though we were on the border of assuming a communistic control of their local community. And that, that picture was always so far from the truth. There just wasn't any such element. And I never heard revolution talked about. And I've been in jungles when they burned them down and burned you out because they, they didn't want you in the community. It wasn't community acceptance. I don't mean that at all. But there was no real threat ever in, in all that I ever saw or did where there was any kind of a threat of communism or of revolutionaries that just wasn't there. There was, uh, I think I, had, I remember one old Swede who was a socialist by declaration. And there was a great number of, of people with socialist background mixed into the working man's class. And that was because they came from Europe. And remember that they had social security in Germany ever since 1880, right? And you had Sweden and Norway and Denmark and all those countries moving towards a more generous social concept of what government was for. These guys had been indoctrinated, and they were immigrants that came in the post-war period after World War I. And you ran into them, and you'd hear them if you were on a harvest crew at night, and conversation would build up while you... These guys had a pretty clear idea that there was a better way to do things, and we were doing it. And I suppose to that degree they were inflammatory, right? But it was an inflammatory based on reason, and they were reasonable men. And, and 
and who are most, and, and you were just, you said there's also a lot of guys like yourself out of high school. Right, they have been right. As, they were no jobs in their own community. Right. I came out of high school in 1930 and uh, was blindsided by the recession, but didn't, re depression. We didn't even know what it was. We didn't know what the term was. We were just, it was in the natural course of events that we were on hard times and we had to hustle for jobs. And we did all the lowly things that are done now by immigrant labor here and, and around this part of the country. We picked apples, we thinned apples in the spring. There was a sequence. You've got, you thinned apples, which is to say you on, in the apple growing country, you knock every other apple off the tree. Were you ever scared during this time that you never make it, that times were gonna get so bad? I never remember any sense of fear of the tomorrow or of the drift of things. We were uh, swimming in a tough stream, but it was in, it was the natural order of things. Once more, to say we, we thought it was of uh, the logical way that history ran. That you had uh, my brother Annual used to make me. He was my oldest brother, and he'd make me work hard because you hired out for tough. You, you know it was tough, and you hired out to handle these big bundles and pitch bundles or pitch hay or whatever. He always felt it was your obligation as a working man to, to give the man his money's worth. That's not revolutionary. That's pretty, pretty conservative. That's a, that's a point of view that I don't, I have a hard time linking the word revolution with the depression. There was not a sense of revolt. There were individual flare-ups under great provocation, but there was no mass move towards uh, the resolution of our problems by revolution. It just did not exist. I saw strikes, and I saw riots, and I saw police attack a uh, uh, gathering of discontented labor men in San Francisco on horseback. I wasn't there for the shooting. I'd left before then. But we used to, there would be maybe 3,000 men. Let's get settled here. Hold on just one second. All righty. The California migration reached out to people in many directions. It just wasn't up in our part of the country. If you looked at the Dust Bowl and the intervening land, people by the hundreds and thousands drove, drove out of there in old rickety wagons with stuff piled up on top of them. And you know, California or bust. This is it. This is, this was the promised land, and, and uh, they came short of money. My God, you can't imagine how little money people had to go on. And they traded off jobs. They did little jobs. They did anything you could for a few gallons of gasoline to keep going west. And they bedded down in the damnedest circumstances wherever there was a public park. My specialty was bandstands. If I could find a bandstand in the park, you could always crawl in under that and be sheltered for the night. And it was a, it was a, a time of, there, were, there was a dynamic to it. It was underway, it was, it was uh, massive in its import. And it's affected California ever since. Okay, that's, okay. Great. The next question I wanted to ask you again was about um, back to Sinclair. Um, you used the term that Sinclair was a minor league miracle. Right. Right. You I like that, that again. Term. I like that. Okay. <laughs> right. So if you could tell me again that, right. that, that that's what you felt about, you know, right. the guys like you. That, right. Okay. Oh, do we need the slate? Okay. Uh, There was a fascination that followed from my exposure to Upton Sinclair that stayed with me all my life. He was, he wasn't big, he wasn't vociferous, he wasn't violent in his language, but he was a kind of a minor league miracle. He, he, he took you with him and he took you into the thinking process. He was a thinking man's radical, you know. He wasn't just an ordinary skimmer, he, he really had pretty profound philosophy and if you ever, if you bought into it as I did, it became more or less the ruling motif of your life. Okay, great. It's 
explain me once more about production for you, since if I know nothing about it, right. we're talking. Right. At the heart of the In Poverty in California program was really a, a very simple phrase, and that was production for use. That was a new term. We know about production for sale and for trade, and we, uh, we had all sorts of, of commerce in which production was, uh, I remember Wendell Wilkie used to say, produce, America must produce. And again, we've got the same chant going by the little fellow from down in Texas. We got to produce. And, uh, but nobody ever put the ending on that phrase. Produce for what? Produce for use. That was what made sense to me, and it still does in this day and time. There is, there is such a capacity for production in America that shuts down when the profits aren't long enough. That seems to me there ought to be some kind of a balance in there that at that stage of the game you could produce it for use and find, a, a, I suppose in a sense, the, the reason the economists criticize it, they say that's reverting to, to a barter system. Well, I don't know that I condemn the barter system in its entirety. That's good. Let me get settled here. Just give me two seconds. Okay, any time. Okay. Production for use um, was more than a slogan. Every place I've ever been in the field of international aid. In I, want, I, I want you to stay with the, the past, and 30, stay in 33, 34. Right, right, all right. <clears throat> Production for use as a slogan, or as the, the, absolutely the substance of end poverty in California, reached out to every farmer, every fruit grower, every Everybody was in the business of producing, particularly in the area of foodstuffs and that sort of thing. Because every f wheat bin in the Northwest was overflowing with wheat, and it was selling for as low as 27 cents a bushel. And that was not production cost by far. And farmers, out of sheer habit, kept growing the damn stuff because it's farmers' growth of wheat. And yet every corn bin, Corn was, I remember hauling corn to the elevator during the Depression, working on a farm in Indiana, when it was three cents a bushel the day we went to the elevator, and the day we got there, it was dropped to two cents a bushel. Now, you, you know this is not production for profit, so it was production for loss. So his production for use was far more, much more sensible than, than the other proposal. Okay. Um. You said you went to. Uh, you said you followed Sinclair around, went from meeting to meeting. That's time. right. I, I suppose I went to only four or five different locations. I wasn't. A, I was not a, a member of the troop. I wouldn't represent myself. I was just a, a convert or an addict, a new, a new formula. I went up into Ventura County, and we went out uh, east of here to the Imperial Valley, and that's where trouble came on because that's where the police and the American Legion with their baseball bats broke up the meeting, and the meeting was never held. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's one other, one other question. I want you a, again to describe to me what you described very beautifully, but I want to get one more time. Give me the visual image of, of knowing of these oranges being, the gas right. being poured on, right. and how that, how mad that made you when, when you knew that there were people that were hungry. Right. Going back to the, to the production for use, I suppose the most inflammatory thing that I witnessed, or was a part of the information and saw the pictures, were great rows of oranges piled as high as your head, and they threw buckets of gasoline up over them, and then they touched a match to them. Oranges are not the best thing to burn. But there they were, they cooked and popped and blistered, and, and you threw away a quarter mile long rack of oranges. I remember one, uh, one other 
fruit that was brought into play in the Depression. That was when I hit San Francisco for the first time, and here we're selling apples on the street. And here would be men dressed in the kind of clothing that you'd go to work in an office. Back to the oranges for a moment. And the oranges, seeing those, made you understand production for use? Yes. Okay. Yes. It, it, the, sight of, the sight of the destruction of that amount of foodstuffs and oranges were one of the early recognized virtuous fruits with lots of, of, of health-giving characteristics. And the idea of burning and wasting that volume of particularly useful foodstuff outraged me. It filled me with anger, and it became almost symbolic of why I was so easy to persuade that this little man with the silver hair was preaching a gospel of salvation, that he was, he was speaking to a very real situation. We were hungry, and here was food just being destroyed. They didn't even have a marketing program for it like they had later in the New Deal where they, they took those same oranges and gave them to people. That became part of the surplus food program, if you remember it, as they did with beef in South Dakota, and they did with up where I lived in those days in South Dakota, that's when we learned to eat grapefruit. All those Texas Democrats had got the, the grapefruit that was grown in Texas into the market, and they were giving it away to the people up in South Dakota who'd sometimes waste it and feed it to the hogs. Some California's just rotting while people are hungry. Right. Okay. Okay, great. Like Thank you. Good. Great. Good. I hope it shapes up for you. Oh, wonderful. Good editing will help you. And also that you, you know, sometimes means we have to be quiet for about a minute. Say nothing so we can get the sound of the room. Okay, this is room tone for the Paul Edwards interview.